I'd like to welcome everyone today. My name is Mark Maynard, and we are glad you are joining us for this Washington Labs Academy webinar on CE marking. We hope you find today's presentation, presentation useful and informative. We have developed our free webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin today, I want to go over a few housekeeping details. First, I hope that everyone can see the title slide on your computer. This presentation is part of our webinar series presented during this calendar year. Next, we have muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. A recording of the presentation is underway and will be sent to all who registered. A training certificate is sent to attendees of the live presentation. You may prefer a full screen view. Just select view and full screen from the drop down menus at the top left of your uh, WebEx box. And then the escape key will allow you to return to normal view. We encourage questions during the presentation. You can submit a question by enabling the chat or Q&A icon at the top or side of your screen and typing your question to the host. We will go through all the questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. We'd like to hear from you. You can see our contact information on the screen now. Please reach out to the academy at wll.com or to the speaker directly at the email address shown. We estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take over half an hour, and we will allow some time for questions at the end. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Steve Ferguson. Steve is Executive Vice President at Washington Laboratories Limited, and he has over 40 years of experience in testing, systems, and device evaluation. He has an instructor in the area of test methods for the past 15 years, focusing on electromagnetic compatibility, product safety, and environmental test methods. His comprehensive knowledge on military standards, Mill Standard 461, Mill Standard 810, and Mill Standard 704, and 1275, and 1399, as well as the CE marking requirements, help him to support test and evaluation for military, commercial, industrial equipment. Now I'd like to welcome Steve. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction there. Mark, how are you today? All right. Good, good. I uh, appreciate the uh, intro. As Mark indicated, we're going to be talking about CE marking a little bit, an introduction kind of thing, um, and, and the implications. I originally put this to, together as a kind of a support thing without all this presentation for our DOD customers who were being introduced into CE marking uh, for NATO programs where CE marking became a requirement on many of the items associated with uh, weapons and military systems. So they were not aware of the process a little bit, so I, I kind of put this together and uh, and realized that other folks get into this too, so we made it part of this uh, introductory webinar series kind of thing. I do want to take just a moment and get my marker turned on here a little bit. A laser pointer, I, I need to use that, I regret to say. What is CE marking? Uh, it's a Comité European or European Community, and it's associated with the European Economic Area. It's not just the European Union, the EU, although the rules and requirements are an EU kind of function here. But uh, many uh, other proximity countries uh, involve ourselves with this, and these rules are typically associated with the um, uh, safety, health, environmental protection requirements here. It uh, allows for free trade. 
and, and and not necessarily free trade, but it's not restricted trade, shall we say, between the EEA. A lot of other organizations and countries adopt similar practices under the CB scheme or using the IEC standards as the basis for compliance. Uh, however, this uh, part of the European harmonization legislation is what it's all about. Now, marking does require that the product compliance with all, and I want to underline all, because we have many, many applicable directives involved in the overall program, and, and I'll continue to discuss that directive part. But these all come under the new legislative form framework, uh, came out in 2008, and has been generally brought forward with a lot of activities going into effect with the 2014 directive series that did a lot of updates in this arena. This new legislative format helps provide for market surveillance rules, you know, better ways to accreditate the conformity assessment bodies. So all the conformity groups are doing essentially the same thing. They were kind of straying away from their country specifics versus uh, uh, any generic kind of thing. So they updated the rules. It also boosts the conformity assessment quality and conference. Uh, and the meaning of what CE marking is all about is dealt with this, establishing a common legal framework for industrial products. A few references of note here, and these are all uh, available by your search mechanisms. The uh, 765 size 2008 provides some uh, surveillance guidelines and et cetera. And uh, 768 2008 helps with the uh, uh, provides a template for the directives and legislation. So we're getting consistent kind of elements associated with all of the directives associated. And 764-2008 provides a lot of uh, general guidelines, but I look at those as being some reference documents you may want to have in your library to get some clarification and a better understanding of the goals and, and targets associated. What is a directive? Well, it's the uh, legislation, the legal framework. It uh, provides for the, uh, the legal, shall we say, or penalties, the legal uh, issues where a suit's barring uh, various things that happen by doing uh, illegal or against the directive concerns. Uh, these can be quite extensive from barring sales to uh, jail terms, et cetera, for intentional violation, depending on the complexity and, and the effects. Uh, there's a lot of things associated with concerns like electromagnetic compatibility, safety, low voltage directive, ROAS, et cetera, many other things. And they also can fall under product categories like medical devices, toys, radios, and et cetera. Uh, a lot of product categories incorporate particular concerns uh, for EMC or whatever. They could have a lot of different things there and how they apply these things. Uh, safety categories fall into this umbrella quite often. Uh, I believe that the current NLF has like 20 uh, directives cited for various products and categories. Uh, there will be up to, to adding as as appropriate. 20, I, I want to take a part of the directive, shall we say, and it's just one of the many that can apply. Like I said, there was 20 directives in my last recollection anyway. And and like one of these currently is the 2014-30-EU or the EMC directive. It provides a scope on, on various products, like is it an apparatus, is it a fixed assembly? And it also excludes things that I have struck out there, like radios, uh, aircraft, and benign equipment, things that have no possible uh, EMC applications, like a tongue depressor. It's automatically benign to EMC, so we don't have to deal with it. And it says that. So you don't really have to evaluate EMC for benign equipment to declare compliance, or you don't need to compare compliance to that. 
a lot of people like to see all the directives satisfied, but uh, again, this is not a requirement to list on your declaration of conformity any associated benign equipment. Puts a lot of definitions into the uh, category on what's defined as fixed equipment, apparatus, uh, et cetera. And it brings up the subject of making available. Uh, making available to the market is, is what's in mind there. Uh, it also identifies that harmonization product standards tend to be the, uh, be associated. Now, the, the product standards are not necessarily listed in the directive. They are listed in the official journal associated with the EMC. So seeing the Euro website for the official journal, tapping on the product uh, uh, specific EMC, the uh, category, you'll get the list of, of harmonized standards there and what's current, when they went into effect, and et cetera. So the directive tells a lot of things to do that. It also establishes the essential requirements, and it shall not emit, and it shall tolerate emissions. So basically, emissions and immunity are dealt with here, but not necessarily because you can't restrict all emissions. So it refers to the product standard, the product part uh, for something, and defines the limits and what it has to tolerate as far as requirements for uh, immunity and emissions levels. It discusses marking, the CE label, its parameters, identification of the product, and, and the fact that you need to establish and clearly identify any precautions that are incorporated. Restrictions and the inst instructions for use need to be a part of your directive. You've got to supply these things that'll happen. I can give you an example. I, years ago, was incorporating a device and, and wanted to buy a piece of test equipment to exercise it. I picked a, an approved product, a uh, CE Mark item to use as my test set to, to drive my equipment while I was doing the testing. And I immediately ran into a big failure mode because restrictions were present that weren't clearly identified back then. And, and what it was was this thing complies if you put it in a shielded enclosure and put a power filter on and filter all the I.O. lines. So I had a whole redesign to make that product really qualified. So those things got away with back in back years and years ago, I'd say 20, 25 years ago. But now the, the new apparatus or the, the new directives prevent all that. It tells you you've got to identify those things to the buyer. That, yeah, you might have to add something. You may need to buy a particular X, but it does that. It also identifies the parameters for the CE mark on the label you'll see over here to the right, where the CE marking parameters are there. And I've got two copies. Well, why did that not go forward here? Well, I hate to say this, but my little banner here and the red thing identifies that CE mark means that it's CE mark properly for the European community. However, this other one with the close proximity letters stands for China export. Uh, I guess my WebEx uh, viewer here doesn't like me to have uh, these kind of uh, animations. So but anyway, it, it refers to China export. I do want to know that these exist. I had a product come in for an evaluation five, six years ago, and it picked a power brick that had this mark, the China export mark versus the CE mark, saying that it was an approved product. When we started to look at it, we said, that's not an approved product. They don't have any controls or measures associated with the CE marking. And by the way, when I happened to use it as to get started with some preliminary look to see how things worked while uh, they identified a new power supply, this thing overheated right there because the batteries that it was charging were completely discharged and it got so hot I could barely, I had to put gloves on to unplug it from the wall. So this is uh, something to be concerned about. Uh, it doesn't necessarily imply a regulatory compliance and regulatory compliance of CE marking may mean self-declaration. So China export may not have the associated rules. A con the directive continues to say I need to get an, 
conformity assessment. Now that doesn't necessarily say I have to test. It says I've got to evaluate the product. Testing may or may not be applicable. You need to document these in the technical file associated with the product and prepare your declaration of conformity. The manufacturer needs to put this together in accordance with the technical documentation. You've got to build it like you say you're building it. So drawings of the product and critical components and things like that that we identify as part of our technical file have to be manufactured with that. If you need to update because of parts obsolescence and pick a new compliant part or evaluate a part, then you can update your technical file to show that you're building what you say you do. You're manufacturing according to the technical documentation. Notified bodies may become involved. It's an option if you use the harmonized standards, following them specifically with no omissions or gaps. And it could be required if deviation standards are used. I do want to discuss this fixed installation kind of a, a process. Uh, the apparatus is a device that can be used and plugged in, installed, etc., and operates as its own entity. It may be incorporated into a larger device, and it may fit only into a larger device as in a fixed installation. For instance, if you have an apparatus that measures the speed of a conveyor belt, and that's the only thing it does, then outside of where the conveyor belt is located, this thing would not necessarily have an application. So the apparatus may fall under the fixed directive, even though it's being built separately but it becomes evaluated under the fixed installation because that's the only option for using it. And I mean only option. Now, I'm not, so you can't just have it saying, oh, I use it on conveyor belts, but it's, if, if I can use it other places too, then it remains an apparatus and needs to fall under its own approval process. Fixed installations may or may not establish uh, essential requirements or component apparatus approval or marking of any kind. You have different issues associated with a fixed installation. However, if you use this fixed installation by analysis, other than testing the installation, you'll have to rectify issues. Well, that comes about even if you test it. If it comes apart or something changes, a defect in a control component, you still have to rectify any issues that may be associated with the um, fixed installation. So no matter what, the manufacturer or the owner of the fixed installation becomes responsible for making it happen. We've indicated that the directive calls for product standards that we said identifies in the official journal, and you need to determine a product standard. Now, by the way, throughout this presentation, I'm going to kind of lean on EMC a little bit as a guide, but don't don't let that stray you from having to comply with all of the applicable. If you have a pressurized device, your pressure vessel may be associated and EMC and low voltage directive and other things. All things have to be satisfied that apply to your product. A lot of product standards have a particular product application driven. I don't like, uh, I use 61326 as a, one of our models here because that's electrical equipment for measurement, control, and laboratory use. Uh, and the title is for EMC requirements. And it also could have collateral standards like uh, dash one, dash one, dash one, dash two, dash one, dash one, dash three, et cetera. It could have those. I don't believe the 61326 does, but it could have collateral standards that also apply. For example, in a medical device, you may have an alarm system. So the alarm system collateral standard would also apply to the product. Uh, software, things like that, that make the essential performance happen need to be associated with it and may need to be approved. A lot of product standards today are hazard-based and they're becoming more so. So you need to take care of a risk analysis or risk management process to say what are the risks. And this can incorporate bringing uh, requirements in that are not currently in this product standard. For instance, a new technology that hasn't been caught in the update yet may be being evaluated and the risk 
management system analysis identifies a specific risk that requires evaluation. That's part of your risk management standard, and you need to have that as part of your file that you accomplished it and what you have done to see that you have uh, reduced the risk to the acceptable level or to a no risk situation, depending on the particular item. A lot of times, uh, items that fall under risk, the risk may be necessary to perform the function. I always like to reference to chainsaws. There's a certain amount of risk, but you need to have that risk in order to do the function. So you end up with a lot of risk management things that I've got an automatic stop and I've got guards and I've got et cetera to help identify the risk or reduce the risk. And this is where the risk analysis comes into being here. So it's becoming more and more prevalent and it's being called out from directives to standards to you name it. So look for that. I've got an example of for an EMC for a permeability meter, something that measures the uh, uh, ferrous metal content or permeability of a particular material. Um, 61326-2-1 applies to sensitive test and measurement equipment. So I may have a very sensitive device to where it's trying to uh, develop a measurement of a field, a magnetic field. So naturally, if I apply magnetic immunity requirements to this, it's probably going to fail because it's built to measure magnetic fields. And so having a stray magnetic field will cause it to react. So this is something that has some specific guidelines. Uh, you might have transducers with signaling condition, 2-3, 2-5, that may have a field bus interfaces. There's lots of dash two applicable things for many devices. I think at my last count, there was over 60 associated with medical devices. There's uh, several associated with this measurement system here. So the part two standard may add, subtract, or modify general requirements. Like for instance, in the sensitive measurement equipment for magnetic field, the general standards say it must be immune to a certain level of magnetic field and then the dash two dash one says, oh, no, no, you can't do that because it is going to be sensitive. It can't comply if you apply that part one standard. So it modifies the requirement for magnetic field immunity and may do other things. So they're always using conjunction. When, by the way, the part two is dominant. If a part two did not get updated when a part one did, then your older part one may still apply so you don't have conflicting uh, information. Most of the time we try to evaluate to cover both areas so we can stay current on everything, but sometimes the, the uh, modification standard takes precedence. So the dash two standard takes precedence over the dash one if the requirements conflict. So product standard, let us continue here. I'm taking this EDMC issue going in where they talk about the administrative issues, the scope, the definitions, references, et cetera, and a test plan or test parameters, how it's configured, what's acceptable, et cetera. So the acceptance criteria deals in the product standard. It normally puts immunity requirements for several kinds of things, and it may or may not be these, and it may be different. But they also include performance requirements. You may or may not have a requirement for magnetic immunity. You may or may not have an ESD requirement if it has some exemptions, et cetera. Normally the ones I have here are more commonly called out than anything else but there are several more test standards associated here that may come into being, and these are identified in your product standard. It says ESD at such and such a level, and it defines the levels of requirements for immunity. Uh, and the EFT burst, where do we apply it to the enclosure port, for usually for fields of some kind, the power lines or the I.O. ports, could it be a power port AC or DC? It could be uh, applicable to one and not the other. It also calls out emissions for radiating conducted and defines it our class A or B. Uh, just to help with the identification, performance criteria A 
indicates that it needs to operate during events. In other words, ESD cannot cause it to go away and have to reboot or restore operation with the operator. B says it can go away temporarily, but will restore operation with no loss of data. So it may needs to come back to life. Sometimes the length of time to restore operation automatically may be called out here. It must come back online within a minute, three seconds, whatever. It may be a part of your criteria. And C typically allows for operator inter, inter, to be interceded to restore operation. In other words, they can reboot the product and reload the application files, et cetera, to put it back into normal operation. However, it won't allow you to have data that is incorrect from the measurement and be shown as valid. That's the performance criteria. In other words, if your data becomes wrong, then that's not going to be acceptable, even though you restore operation. And you may have to be able to identify whether the data is valid or not. So normally it has to throw away the current data where the event happened without recording it as a valid measurement. And the emissions class A is typically associated with the industrial environment. And sometimes uh, uh, it's usually considered heavy industry where basically a, a power transformer feeds the area. Uh, a B category is more residential or light, where you may, light industry where you may be part of a, uh, a mall with other businesses sharing the main transformer into the building. So you could have a B where light industry requirements could apply, so you don't interfere with the uh, other things associated with the same power distribution. The test standard, as I was indicated, comes about is called out by the product standard. For example, EN61000-4-3 is a radiated RF immunity test standard. It's called out of the product standard, and the product standard says, oh, it's got to be immune at a level of 10 volts per meter, for example, over this frequency range with this modulation and et cetera. So those things are there. This test standard becomes more test specific. Ex execution requirements are, are called out. Where the administrative things happen, the test levels are defined, a list of choices, and they're specified by the product standard. And the test equipment, like uh, is the chamber required, an antenna, a generator, amplifiers, et cetera, in order to accomplish this particular radiated immunity test, I may need all of those things. It talks about facility parameters, the environment, control measures, where you might have to apply a chamber, or you might have to deal with uh, atmospheric pressures at a certain range, et cetera. Calibration or uniform field is normally called out where we have a pre-calibrated field when we place the test article in a place and generate that field to allow for the uniform field. The uniform field method is used in other things and for other methods like uh, confirming your, your uh, anechoic chamber performance, things like that. may use a, a, a uniform field to try to validate that. Test configurations, what is table top, floor standing, and how to arrange wiring. And the procedure and execution. How am I going to do this? And the evaluation of the results. Did it comply? What's the pass-fail criteria? It needs to be associated and defined by the standard, whether it's A, B, C, et cetera. And it calls for preparation of a test report, and the content is pretty well there. It gives a lot of guidance information or precautions that get you bad data without recognition of the bad data. So these guidelines are, are pretty decent to have there. It also gives options for doing the test and the appendices and et cetera, because not all things can be dealt with in a confined environment. You may have large equipment that you just can't fit into a test chamber, so open area testing might be involved. Uh, Walkie-talkies may be specified for radio interference where you can't get approval to look at all frequencies in the test band. So it specifies particular ones and takes the risk associated with it. A lot of those things come about through the fixed installation thing when they're extremely large because oftentimes that uh, fixed installation gets a tailored configuration when it's built. 
and, and several things there. So if you're not confused enough, let's look at it into a kind of a flow chart. This directive <clears throat> says you've got to take care of everybody that's available. And the product standard comes into being, which may have collateral standards, as indicated, and particular specific to a product. So these things now feed into the overall test platform where all of these elements feed in this to say, how do I do emissions testing and what's the requirements? How do I do ESD and what's the requirements? How do I do this? So this test can become involved and involved and involved. And all of them that apply would come into being here. And I put repeat over here because even after EMC, I'm going to look at a similar kind of arrangement for safety, low voltage directive, et cetera. But I'm evaluating it for the design or for the test performance here. EMC tends to be a lot more based on performance execution. There's a fixed limit, there's a fixed disk. Sometimes the safety, the LVD, low voltage directive, et cetera, calls for a judgment call. So you may need to understand, well, what's the potential for a safe? Can I get shot? And the standards, the product specific standards, provide a lot of guidance there again. However, this hazard base says, look at it. Do I have an application or not? Make the risk assessment part of your file and part of your program. The test and evaluation needs to look at that. It needs to see that there has not been new things added or exemptions provided or any of those things through the Risk Management Association so we don't over test or apply requirements that are not applicable to that specific product. So this calls for a lot of things to go on. Remember CE can be quite confusing unless you follow it. Even uh, we that do this thing on a routine basis have a lot of confusion. Declaration conformity. Let's assume that you had an apparatus and you've uh, went through all your evaluations and decided that you comply. You use the harmonized standards and, and you want to make a declaration of conformance. The content of the declaration of conformance is identified here. What is it? Name and address of man, who's the representative? <clears throat> the statement that the declaration is the manufacturer's responsibility. I, Joe at uh, X ABC company, declare conformity with the following things. Description of what it is, description of the legislation. The, the uh, directive, what directive applies here? Reference is made to the relevant harmonized standards. So I may say I declare compliance to the EMC directive 2014 slash 30 slash EU uh, uh, with product standard EN 61326-1 and EN 326-2-1, whatever is applicable here. The dates of it, the declaration of the legislation, the reference to standards, and any notified body information and a certificate if it's applicable. Let's say you didn't follow the standards, but you went to a notified body and they provided you a test and evaluation program as an alternative because you can't follow the standard for whatever reason. That certificate from the notified body needs to be a part of your declaration and signatory information and date. Who is legally responsible? Who can be penalized? An officer of the company is usually required. Unless it's an official officer kind of status, declaration tends not to be valid. So when, if you are the designated compliance direction, you need to be provided officer status for declaring conformity with the requirements. The technical file, I've kind of hedged on this thing a little bit. It gives a lot of information. What is what is going on here with your whole program? Who are you? You know, what's what's these things, brand name and model numbers and a file number? When did I issue this file? When did I update it? Keep modifications going. The reasons for applying for a technical construction file. This usually is required for machinery, and it may be applied to other products that are incorporated into machinery, control systems, etc. You may have other reasons, but the technical construction file definitely applies to machinery. 
product description and variations. How many models? Can I get it in gray and blue and whatever? What model changes happen? Can I have a partial set of products? Do they evaluate all the options? I need to know the physical and electrical characteristics. This is particularly important in identifying critical components, critical features. I've got to have XYZ filter into this thing in order to meet the MC requirements. That becomes a critical component to identify. Therefore, if that filter gets changed to a new model, you, your file no longer conforms to what you're making. You have to update the file to provide the updated critical components list. It's a part of the standard. All of you that are associated with uh, agency listings, such as UL or TUV or similar NRTLs, fight with this battle all the time. And you're updating your things, you're subject to inspection by that uh, approval agency. When you do a declaration of conformity, you are doing that. You're taking on the role of that agency and you're taking on the obligation to make sure you keep everything up to date. This involves making sure that your product conforms to current standards. If a uh, updated to the European directive change or a uh, product standard change, you're declaring conformity to the new one and any evaluations need to be incorporated. Uh, we run into that occasionally where somebody keeps building the same product and fail to take in that new rules suddenly applied and they didn't update their files. Then they run into a customs issue. They ship a product in and it didn't conform. And customs stops it because they're not compliant with the current standard. You have to provide for that when you import. And you may need to take care of a test procedure or in situ on-site testing where things are not done in conformance with the standard because the standard says use the uh, harmonized standard and that's never an in-situ in case. So you'll always get involved with having a notified body opinion associated with in-situ testing. Keep your test reports as part of the technical file. Any user and service instructions, photographs, description of your quality system. What are you doing to make the confirmation here? And again, that notified body opinion. Uh, I've seen technical files that include a video, a DVD, where the, the DVD shows people how to properly operate things. So it's not unusual. So whatever makes your product right, you take that video and make it part of the shipment of the product to say, view video before assembling, before installing, before operating, things like that. If, if that's an appropriate way to convey the information so people do the right thing and the common mistakes are accounted for, like uh, don't ever put this in without a concrete enclosure around it or something. Uh, make sure it's bolted to the floor on a non-combustible surface to control potential fire risks. Things of this nature are part of your uh, requirements here, and they need to be very clear that people understand that. Don't let it fall over on somebody if it's a tip hazard. Things like get, get into your file, and they need to be very clear. So reviewers for safety need to say, well, is this adequate, et cetera. And you, the responsible party, need to be aware of what's required so you can say, I'm developing it in a standard. So the, the technical file can have many, many, many kinds of pieces of information. A lot of these can be electronic where the access to the files are there. But remember, keep your updates to happen. Let's talk about ROAS for a moment, restriction on hazardous substances. In 2011, 65 EU came out as a recast, and it added several previously empty products. It provides a phase-in period for the implementation, and some of those are just coming into being here, with some still outstanding. Uh, what, what products apply? Such and such may be, uh, like fluorescent lights have a, a part of mercury, so it got exempted from those until a certain time. Uh, it, it could have a phase-in period. There's no way I can go through all of the potentials here in this time frame, but you need to look at that directive. Again, that's another downloadable one with no charge. You can go to the European directive or search for that and find a downloadable file there. 
you need to take routes to demonstrate compliance. And test is one of the ways to do that. There's a couple of ways other than that. The, the, the testing calls for the grinding of the product into a spectrometry analysis. And, and you have to maintain your process control to ensure that you continue compliance. Another alternative is called out in the ROAS uh, uh, directive is, I think it's 50081, where you can declare based on having all of the components comply. So if all of the components comply, the whole product together has to be dealt with. The product is into these minute particles and it's on a homogeneous basis. So if I have things that are removable, like a power filter, I take that off and separately take care of that. So can I separate the paint from the, the chassis? No. So that becomes part of a homogeneous material where I can separate them for recycling or other ways to take care of hazardous substances going into the uh, waste products or being exposed to people. So you can do the testing. There's also um, generally accepted now as uh, XRF x-ray fluorescence, where you can do this with a handheld device to keep track of it. People use this for quality assurance purposes. Normally, if this thing passes this SKRF testing, then you're going to be compliant. However, you can fail XRF and still be compliant on depending on the type of materials in certain cases. A lot of uh, companies have this available as a sample on component shipments that come in from wherever their suppliers are to help avoid integration of a non-compliant batch into their product where the vendor decided to ship a non-compliant issue. They had a, a process change that got out of hand and they didn't identify it. Keeps your products from becoming problematic or being caught in the field. So several ways go here. A lot of folks use the, I only buy certified and I certify my performance, and they keep quality samples going on with this XRF testing, and only destroy something when it absolutely becomes necessary. So this configuration management is clearly the preferred process for most people I've ever encountered. I'm seeing this XRF come about because test systems have become quite affordable, and it lets you get a quality assurance sample at your incoming acceptance things for shipments of products before it, before you're allowed to get into your supply chain, into your warehouse, and et cetera. The WE, the Waste of Electrical and Electronic Equipment, recast in 2012, dealt with this uh, uh, recovery and reuse, and it provided a phase-in period. The ECHO Design Directive 2009 establishes these requirements based on a lot of things, energy uses, recovery and recycling requirements based on product type. Directly associated with the ROAS, so you'll need to figure out how this applies to you. Do you have a method to have products shipped back? Uh, I know a vendor that uh, etches labels into a product with a laser plastic uh, uh, writing tool, so there's no labels. It's etched onto the product, so there's no differentiation for label material or adhesives and things like that that would require separation to recovery. So the whole plastic thing goes in without separation. And remember, it removes products, material that would impact health is associated with this. Some odds and ends. I do want to talk about placing on the market. Placing on the market is indicative of revised standards have an effective date. So when I place it on the market, I've got to conform with the effective date. Some uh, in the official journal, it says the date of uh, applicability. Placed on the market must comply with the standard. So therefore, when I place it on the market, in other words, I release it for first sale, it got to conform with the rules in effect at the time of release. An apparatus package for shipment or exchange into the user is considered on the market. Okay, a package for shipment or exchange into the user is considered on the market. So that's making available. That's a differentiation. This item says, I'm shipping it to an end user. This is there, it's packaged, it's on its shipment. Can I pay package in the warehouse and then let things ship five years later? No. 
if a shipment has not been established and it is not available for the market, okay, when you're making available, says I am ready to ship this thing right now, and and it has an order to ship it against to the end user. So those two separations uh, are generally questions we get a lot. The wrong directive sometimes happens. An incorrect standard is sometimes redirected to the standard of an integrated system. Like for instance, I may have a piece of information technology equipment and I want to use it in a measurement system. So that laptop computer or whatever may say instead of it conforming to the uh, IT equipment 55024, I may have to make it comply to 61326 because of interval to the measurement system. So I may need to decide the wrong directive and apply a directive that's not obviously there. You can't declare compliance to directives without the evaluation to those. So if I have measurement equipment, that's not the same as IT equipment. So I may need to take care of a product standard. Measuring devices, sometimes monitor machine, etc. So machinery may get involved. It usually means a harmonized standard is not followed and a notified body involvement tends to be necessary. So the harmonized standard, I may qualify the laptop with CE marking on it as an information equipment and I want to apply it differently, then I need to get a notified body involvement or evaluate to the harmonized standard that you want to declare. Uh, REACH, so the Registration Evaluation Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals. If your processes involve chemicals that are consumed or used or disposed of, you'll need to consider all of the REACH requirements. There's literally hundreds of these things to look there and they're readily available through an internet search. Manufacturer's responsibility. The manufacturer is usually considered as a whole of the product brand. They may contract the actual manufacturing. Now let's say I am a supplier of such and such products and I buy the ABC brand computer and I want them to put my name on it. The manufacturer may be ABC, but the name is yours. The name of the product brand is your responsibility. The ABC may be building it and putting your name on it that becomes them for the, you're contracting them to do the actual manufacturing. The product brand holder is the key here. Responsibilities include designing manufacturer to meet your essential requirements. What are the essential requirements? The things it must do to be considered safe, to, to meet its required operation, and to remain safe, compliant with various standards, etc. You need to prepare and maintain the technical file. You are the product brand holder. Conformity assessment arranged to get that evaluation done or do it yourself. And incorporate any updates. Keep up with your applicable files. Provide the declaration of conformity and provide for product marking. You need to have all of these things per the directives. The specific directive requirements are identified there. So sometimes CE marking is becoming a common requirement for military equipment. This is new to those that have always been specific to Department of Defense or other military organizations. DOD contractors are faced with the compliance to the mill specs and the commercial specs here simultaneously. So you may need to take care of both of them as you go. Requirements that are not called out in the mill spec may become a requirement because of the application or disposal at the end of life. Safety evaluations are imposed and the use of agency approved components within their ratings and conditions of acceptability adds some additional considerations. Conditions of acceptability. What makes it right? Do I have to do something to make it an approved component? And do I use it within the ratings? If I put in a, uh, a five watt power supply and, and I rate it, run it at seven watts, if it doesn't maintain control, I'm outside of its ratings. So it may need an evaluation evaluation. A condition of acceptability say, oh, in order to get this temperature range, you got to provide airflow, things like this. These are associated with developing into your product. So a lot of things come into here. There's a, a information is there, but assimilating the total breadth of requirements 
take some time and support a specialist. Somebody picking this up on the first day doesn't have the breadth of knowledge here. You need to get assistance quite often. That, that is a necessary evil. I get I got a couple of frequently asked questions. We build products in batches and often have items in the warehouse orders to support prompt ship. If the standard changes, can the existing products be shipped as conforming? Note that the manufacturing date is prior to the revised standard. It usually says I am placing on the market that's the first time the making available it's in distribution so if i have it in a shipment mode it's satisfying an order then it can be shipped making available is the key area here the 2014 30 eu article 1 part 57 discusses these in terms of a transition and the blue guide which is a, a guide to help you understand requirements and etc section 2 provides a lot more detailed guidance in this area Refer to that. The blue guide is uh, readily available uh, for the internet search and download. Uh, the radio equipment directive red and the low voltage directive. The red calls out for low voltage directive compliance for any power voltage level. Which product standard applies for compliance and evaluation? The red says you've got to comply, but since you're not an LVD, if in a lot of cases you're under 75 volts, you may not, or 60 volts AC, I forget the exact detail, but when you don't, have, you're not required to, to, via the LVD, you still have to do it. So what you need to do to pick a standard is, assume the radio is removed, what standard would then apply? And I, I do that associated thing. So it treated as if the radio wasn't there. The low voltage directive is not applicable. My product operates from 12 volts, so LVD is not applicable. Does this mean that an electrical safety evaluation or declaration is not applicable? The low voltage directive would not be applicable. However, general product safety direction, directive 2001 95EC, would apply and the standards are identified for electrical equipment. This is in the uh, official journal where there's a general product safety requirement and identification of what standards would apply depending on the product. So you may need some help, especially if you're new into this business. A lot of laboratories and Washington Labs is one of those that provides design consultation, helps you get the compliance built in first time, planning, developing procedures, test and evaluation for various products, quality, environmental, power quality, et cetera, and can serve as a notified body for EMC and the radio equipment directive. So by all means, don't hesitate to hear Europea, Europa official journal is there, the blue guide. I do have a link in here. I forgot that I did that. Um, the Washington Labs has a lot of things on our website. Or you can reach out to me, Steve F at WLL.com. I'm open for questions, Mark. Hey, Steve. Thanks for all that uh, great information today. Uh, I have received a few questions. Uh, the first one here is, where can I find information on the actual CE mark that must go on the product? Uh, I just kind of touched on that blue guy. Is is a lot of information is there. It's it's a basic, well uh, documented way to look at the standards. When you also look at the directive, don't omit the fact that in the annexes, some details are there about marking requirements. And it usually shows up in the same area on all directives. That's why this NLF is trying to harmonize the directive or legislation rules. So you got to take care of both of them, uh, the uh, directive, and you can get guidance through the blue guide. It is a uh, uh, link there. Okay, Steve. Uh, one from the chat feature I just saw here. Uh, are IFU required to be hard copy inbox documents? Or can a reference to a link on a web page be used? It uh, can be many many things. There are safety requirements that needs to be with it. Uh, that, that you've got to say you've got to do X before you do it somehow. So usually people put in at least a short pamphlet defining things and telling them you must do this. It's a requirement and. Sometimes you can do this by having a lockout where the thing 
will not start until you get the code from your access on the file. So, you know, first time startup may require a code to be entered to get you started. Uh, that way you've got some feedback as you manufacturer that, yeah, the person did in fact access the documents. So their responsibilities are there. Uh, there's some things that require a quote, quasi hazardous situation that says, you've got to do this to make sure everything is good before you connect here or power may cause a burnout or a uh, minor explosion, a fire. Uh, you know, it, you must charge the batteries up before you get start anything. Things like that can be in a very short pamphlet and you can refer to online things. Most receivers like to see some sort of document with it. Also remember the language situation, your documentation, hard copy or, or soft copies after the requirement, the required languages have to be available for use. So by all means don't hesitate to consider that. But generally speaking, a lot of information is now available online or through a thumb drive or something to let this thing get unlocked and, and actually get to your, your present. Um, I don't see anything that absolutely requires hard copy. But read your directive to be sure of some specific things may be identified there. Okay. All right, Steve. Uh, another question was in reference to the Declaration of Conformity, or DOC. How do you determine if a photo or image of the product is necessary? It usually isn't necessary. Uh, description for your labeling contents so they can compare your declaration to what the label says on the product. Some products are very small and the labeling is very tough to read. So you might want to deal with a photograph with an expansion on it to make it more clear if it becomes non-readable or, or easy to read. A photograph typically is not required unless there's something specific that is not conveyed through a normal kind of declaration content. Okay. Okay, Steve. And then another one was, uh... I wanted some further discussion. Uh, he has, uh, this person has a product in his warehouse that he put there a few years earlier, and they complied with the standards and were in place at a time, but uh, maybe one or two standards have been updated since then. Do I have to retest the products? You may. You really have to evaluate it. If the updates did not cause a change in the product, the boxed equipment may comply. Okay, so you just need to evaluate it. Your declaration of conformity can conform to that. You must might be able to say that manufacturer date of X still conforms on your declaration. That way you've covered the old manufacturing dates. If you've shipped the product, you're hosed and you gotta pull it back and evaluate it typically. Uh, so it can't be just sitting someplace waiting to, to go away. You need to make uh, a conscious effort to when it was made available. In other words, it's on its way to an order for an end user. So being in the warehouse waiting for the truck to show up to you name it. And it's not necessarily waiting for an order. If the order is received, it's too late. I mean, if the order is received after the product was placed there, that's not made available. It's sitting there waiting, hoping. So made available is the key there. The Blue Guide Section 2, again, provides a lot of detail there. And the Directive Item 57 of Article 1. Okay, Stephen, I had a request for you to explain the term permissible loss of performance. Uh, permissible loss of performance. Let's say you have a, I'm going to make up an example. You have a, an automated scanning tool for x-rays. That the x-ray uh, is a printed document and scans through the, to, to the, scans through the scanner to, to enhance the imaging and et cetera. So you can identify more things. And let's say an ESD event caused the image to not go forward. As long as you know that the image got halted, didn't get captured, didn't get evaluated, you can allow that performance degradation because you can say, that one's no good, I'm going to rescan it now that I get restored operation. So permissible loss, as long as you can identify that it happened and it's not required to operate during the event, then you're, you're good to go. Let's say uh, 
you operate a chicken farm and your controller goes offline so the air conditioning or cooling fans for the chicken house shut down and they don't restart with your controller. That's an acceptable condition because you'll kill all your chickens from overheating. Things like that. Uh, it identifies the performance thing and it might say you've got an alarm that's got a restore operation to the fan within five minutes or two minutes or something. And that's considered the performance criteria. What is acceptable or essential performance? So identifying what's essential and then conforming to that allows the permissible loss outside of that essential area. Does that make sense? Yeah, appreciate all the information today, Steve. So we've gone to the end of our hour here and uh, want to uh, give a few reminders on our uh, uh, continued series of webinars. So, uh, our next free webinar will be on December 14th, covering the wireless and telecom requirements for the countries of Africa. And it'll be presented by me, Mark Maynard. And you can sign up online. That's already out there on our uh, website, WLL.com, then go to training. We recently published our schedule of free international approvals webinars to be presented each month in 2018. And be sure to check on our website for other webinars going to be uh, continue to be posted as we lead up to 2018, uh, both paid and free. Uh, we're expanding our free webinars uh, with the goal of having two per month uh, to be introduced to some topics and uh, help you out on your uh, compliance uh, battles with your products and uh, give you the information you need to make the best uh, decisions for your companies. Well, this concludes today's webinar. On behalf of myself, Steve Ferguson, and Tire Washington Laboratories Academy team, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I will now close the meeting. Thank you for attending, and goodbye.